the Prince of Conde that you see in Almost a Queen is different from the one that you will later see in the short story I wrote, Safe in My Arms. And the reason for that is, first, it's just a different difference of time. Almost a Queen starts in 1572. Henry is about, I'd say about 19 or 20 years old, so he's uh, a new groom. He's only been married for about a month. He's extremely young. He is war hardened, uh, but at the same time, he really doesn't have a lot of experience on this plate. And by the time Safe in My Arm occurs, it's 1587, 1588, so it's about 16 years later. So you can imagine how much one person would mature in 16 years. So you see a little bit of maturity on his age and in his decisions. He's also been to war a lot longer. So the Henry, yeah, the Henry that you'll see in the two different stories, so there's going to be a little difference in that. The other difference is a decision, is a decision that I made stylistically. When I wrote Once a Queen, I wanted it to be written in first person. I wanted it to be from Marie's perspective. One thing that really attracted me to writing fiction, writing historical fiction, was going through and finding women who had been misunderstood, underrepresented, misrepresented, demonized, and trying to look at it from the perspective of the woman herself telling her story. So in Once a Queen, so in Almost a Queen, you get the story of Marie who has basically been handed a life that really doesn't fit her. And she's trying to, at this young age of 19, 20 or so, she's trying to figure out what kind of a life she wants to have for herself. What, uh, what and who she wants to keep in her life. How she wants to express herself in a spiritual sense. And where exactly her place is going to be in the court. And you get all of that filtered through her experiences and her prejudices. So the Henry that we meet is really going to be the Henry that she sees through her own eyes. And then later in Safe in My Arms, that I made the decision to write in third person. Because I felt it was going to be a lot easier for you to understand the story from Henry's perspective. And also through Charlotte Catherine's. And there isn't a lot written about Henry's first marriage with Murray and there's very little written about Charlotte Catherine and Charlotte's and Charlotte's one of those women who has been demonized and people just kind of made historians have just made up their their minds that she was a murderess and she was evil she was out to get her husband and it was just leave it at that which it really I I think limits our understanding of who she is and it also makes her a very dull flat story so I thought it would be easier to try to tell the story in third person. At the same time, everything that I've learned about Henry Prince of Conde was that he was quarrelsome. I don't doubt for a moment that he was devoted to the Protestant cause. I think that his faith was gen it was genuine. And I think he was extremely upset about the idea of having to convert to Catholicism. But at the same time, Henry always, but at the same time, Conde really reminds me of the kind of person who is just difficult and quarrelsome just for the fact that that he likes to be difficult and quarrelsome. I mean, if you say the sky's blue, then by God, he's gonna tell you that it's purple. And I feel like he always likes to see himself as if he's always the victim, if he's all, as if he's always fighting up against the system. And I think it's a good position for him to be as a Huguenot, really writing him and putting him, pitting him up against Marie, who to me was more of a coalition builder. She was more of a moderate. And she was someone who I think would just try to find some way to compromise with anyone. Henry, on the other hand, has no desire whatsoever to compromise. He, by God, he's just going to argue just for the sake of arguing. And then later, during his second marriage to Charlotte Catherine, I got the feeling that Henry had tempered a little bit. He had matured. He also had an injury that had forced him off the battlefield, which meant that he lost a lot of his identity. Not to be a little too judgmental, but in a great way, just Henry's greatest quality was his military process, was his military abilities. I mean, he, he didn't have a winning personality. As shallow as it is to say, he wasn't terribly attractive. And basically, you know, if he didn't have his ability, I mean, if he didn't have the ability to be on the battlefield, I don't feel that Henry really thought that he had that much to live for. And I think that made it really difficult for him to go back and and convalesce for a couple months. And I think no matter how Charlotte Catherine received him, I think he was just going to be a pain in the butt patient. And for me, I always saw Charlotte Catherine as the kind who would just to your face say, 
yes dear yes dear okay dear okay and kind of lure you into that false sense of security and i think because henry's so used to argue with everyone he finally found someone who really wasn't gonna go toe to toe with him and argue with him so it, it threw him off a little bit he got this false sense of security and in a lot of ways it really wasn't that difficult to draw that characterization of conde because i noticed when i was doing my research that one of the sources said that when henry the fourth when henry the king of navarre who would later become henry the fourth of france when he heard that his cousin had been killed he was very upset and he wanted to get to the bottom things he wanted to get justice um he really suspected that someone in henry's household or s several someone's had something to do with his death because it was a little too sudden it was a little suspicious and navarre was really upset about that i mean he genuinely did grieve his cousin but at the same time conde really had no desire to try to be very personable and to try to get along with other people and in that sense henry was navarre was a little relieved to know that he had lost this thorn in his side who had pretty much been his tag along because well they're cousins and they were both protestants and both protestant leaders so i get the feeling that no matter how you tried to handle conde it was just pretty much impossible to, to try to find any kind of middle ground with him which really amazes me because i i've always wondered how he's able to go to geneva and the german princes and get any money for the protestant cause because you think you know he's just so irascible and just abrasive and hard to get along with and you think well, I you know, maybe they gave him money so that he'd leave their countries. Maybe that's what it was. I'm, I'll give you 60,000 florins if you'll just get the heck out of Switzerland. That, that could have been it. Maybe that was it. You know, I hadn't really thought about that before. But yeah, it's writing kind of has really been interesting for me because on one sense, it's, it's kind of one dimensional when you just have someone who's just always miserable and always complaining. But at the same time, it's really good to have that opposition to have someone who's actually you know generally going up against whoever your protagonist is and i've enjoyed writing him i like the ability to write him in two different time periods that doesn't happen a lot um, probably lasted a lot longer than most people would have expected him to live but um that's been my experience writing, writing conde i tried to keep him as true to the historical sources as possible but uh, i think in marie of cleve's case you know, the first princess to conde I, I think that living with him was probably probably just absolutely enough to want to pull her hair out.